Welcome to Fruitland Christian Fellowship. I'm Chuck Reich, one of the pastors here. Honored and privileged to serve here in Fruitland, New Mexico. And uh, today we're going to be talking about our Father, uh, Father's Day. It's a Father's Day message, but we have earthly dads, biological dads. We also have spiritual dads, but we also have a heavenly Father who loves us so much. And we're going to see how Jesus talked about his heavenly Father all through the scriptures. It's our Father, our Father. And at some point, Jesus starts saying, my Father, which upset the religious leaders because they interpreted that as him being equal with God. Uh, and he was. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, they didn't get it at the time. And after the resurrection, some get it. And even today, some have a hard time getting it. Um, whether, you know, he's God or not in the flesh. So, again, it's the mystery of the Trinity. We break that down a lot here. We look at the scriptures, what the scriptures say. We're looking at a few today that, um, that might challenge you a little bit because some will say he's just a teacher amongst many teachers. And if he was just a teacher, then it would just be another bunch of rules and regulations that you would either follow or wouldn't follow of a teacher like Buddha or Confucius or Mohammed. But his claims to be the Son of God, the I Am, before Abraham was, I Am, which was thousands of years before him. Um, these are just some statements, the great I Am statements, that uh, there's seven of them in the book of John. So anyway, we're, we're going to be in a few places today. We already did our announcements and our tithes and offerings. If you haven't been to your church, your church is missing you. You're missing church. You're not being fed and growing and hanging out with brothers and sisters and having sweet fellowship um, but your church is missing you because there's a part for you to be playing in the church. We call it church service because we come to serve, not be served. That's the same motto Jesus had. Uh, although he was Lord, he could have been served, and we do serve the Lord. He said, I haven't come to be served, but I've come to serve and lay down my life as a ransom for many. So he's our example. We'll see that today. But, uh, so that's our message, our fathers. It's a Father's Day message. Even Jesus at 12 years old, this is a famous saying, uh, we're going to look at that, and I, I figured that was just a great title. I must be about my father's business. And if you're a serious Christian, and you're intentional about sharing good news and discipling other people, then you are in God's business. God has a business, and uh, he's in the people business. Let's just say that, right? And if, <laughs> if God's in the people business, then you're in the people business. We're in the people business. So we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2. Uh, the key verse there is 49, but again, we look at usually 10 or 20 verses at a time, not just to take one out of context, uh, hopefully keep it in context. I've always heard it said, if you take a text out of the word context, you're left with con. And we don't want to con anyone around here. We want to give them the truth, nothing but the truth, the whole truth, so help us God, right? So Matthew 6, 9 is, the, is where we find the Our Father's Prayer. It's also in Luke, and then also John 10 the key verse there, 30, I and my Father are one. So again, according to Israel, the Lord, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, he is Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. He's Lord. He's God with skin on. And that just went over their head, and we'll see that too. So super excited to go over this message today. Uh, we're going to start in Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Also, we gave out a bunch of Bibles, um, spirit-filled. I don't want to do a close-up, Jared, on this. But we gave, did anybody bring your study Bible today? If you haven't, um, I've got about four left at, uh, uh, and three in the, in the, in the front lobby. Uh, we've handed out 73 of 80 that Total Christian Television sent us. They have a warehouse full of them. And it's costly to ship them, so as soon as we get some more shipping dollars, uh, there's like eight in a box, and they're heavy. Um, and they sent us like 10 plus devotions and stuff. So we have a lot of people that could use a study Bible. But I want to show you this. Page, um, let's go right in the middle, page 1343. Right after Malachi, before Matthew, right in the middle there, they have some... And again, I want us to start using this because... We do Bible studies here. This isn't a sermon, feel-good sermon. Jared and I just make sure of that. Even Scott and, and Chris Curley, when we teach, whoever gets up here and shares a testimony, it's a time to dig into God's Word. It's not a feel-good ice cream message, although we hope the Word of God does that for you, but we also want it to convict where it's supposed to be convicting. Correction, reproof. All right, the Word of God is, is God-breathed. It's, it's instruction of righteousness. So that the man and woman of God may be equipped for every good work. And it's just every page has a 
chock full of nuggets. There's over 3,000 pages. So in the middle, if I told you the page number, 1343, is the harmony of the Gospels. That's what we've been doing for the last two years when I preach, is going through the life of Jesus in a chronological order. So it has the date, and they did, they've been able to figure it out with calendars and, and other historic people that were living and dying, kings and queens of certain regions that have lived and died. A lot of historical documents between A.D. and B.C. We have a really good idea that Jesus, uh, the year that he was born, the page before that kind of gives a whole history of Israel, and it shows that the Christ was born 4 A.C. and then died A.D. 33, and then the church history after that, the next hundred years. It just breaks down, has maps, has a lot of good stuff in here, but you'll see out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke is the one gospel writer who puts everything in an orderly account. So that column is chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It stays in a chronological order, while Matthew, Mark, and John, you'll see it skipping around from 6 to 13 to 12. So based on the gospel writer and who he was writing to, they weren't necessarily putting it in a chronological order. But whenever we read a, read a book or watch a movie, there's a middle, there's a beginning, there's an end. So, and it shows you if there's a teaching or a miracle or an event in one, two, three, or all four Gospels, it'll show you where they are. So this is just a great study guide. And then as we look at some of these scriptures, when we go to that page to see the scripture, I know I've been really showing you guys the verses, but when we're looking at the verses, you can ponder what's in the, they have, they have all kinds of little golden nuggets, study notes on the bottom to help explain, maybe if it was a prophecy fulfilled in the Old Testament, it'll tell you where, what he's referencing in the Old Testament. Um, there's also a word wealth, which is usually a Greek word or a Hebrew word, and it shows you the Strong's Concordance number. Some of the other places that same word might have been used, or maybe that's the only place that word's used, and how it's used in ancient Hebrew or ancient Greek, and why we've translated it in our current language based on the vocabulary we use now. So the 1600s, King James Version, we don't speak like that anymore. There's a lot of words in there. I don't even know what the meaning is because that's not our current vocabulary list, right? And we don't say, thee setteth unto thouest. I don't speak like that. So it just, can, you know, it's, it's hard to understand. So we've, again, always started with the original text and, and uh, did the best we can to find sometimes word for word or phrase for phrase. So we're going to be using this as we go through the Bible study. But for the sake of getting the text in, let's pray and ask God to bless the Bible reading and Holy Spirit teach us. So Lord, yes, Father God, Abba, Father God, that's what uh, I think Paul wrote. He said, our, our spirit is children of God. Our conscience bears witness that we are children of God crying out, Abba, Father, which is Daddy, Daddy. That's who we're coming to. Our Father who art in heaven, you are holy. We pray you'd bless our study, the reading of your word as we go through it, that you'd help us give us understanding, and may we honor you in everything we say and everything we do, as well as our earthly fathers, our spiritual fathers, mentors, and of course the moms. Uh, we've celebrated that. So we just thank you for our parents. Some of them are in your presence. Some of them are still here. Some of them might be missing. So we just pray that today, even those fathers who haven't stepped up to, to be a dad with a sense of holy conviction, and be reconciled to their family and finish strong, Lord. That they would help be reconciled to their family, their sons and daughters, and make things right. Because we know your grace is amazing and there's nothing too hard for you. So our heart breaks for those broken relationships today. And even some of the sins in the past. I pray you would help them reconcile and be forgiven. And move forward with the time we have left. And we pray all this in and through the name of Jesus. If you agree with that, you would say? Yes. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Alright, so Luke chapter 2. This is where Jesus, in chapter 2, um, Luke does a good job talking about, obviously, the birth of the Messiah, his circumcision when he was 8 years old, and then we find him 12 years old in verse 41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover, verse 42, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast, 43, when they had finished the days... As they returned, the boy Jesus, capital B, capital J, because we believe he's deity, so he gets a capital for a pronoun, lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, 
they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. So little side note here, um, parents, if you ever ever lost your child for 24 hours, you're in good company. (laughs) Joseph and Mary, they lost Jesus. And uh, it's like, reminds me of Forrest Gump when uh, Lieutenant Dan says, Forrest, did you find Jesus? I didn't know I was supposed to be looking for him, sir. You know, and that's what people say. I found Jesus. No, no, no. He found you. He's been trying to get your attention for a very long time, and you finally heard his voice. So he's been looking. He goes out looking for the lost. I wrote a song, My, 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 my Savior on the Cross Came Looking for the Lost, because it rhymed, and that's exactly what it is. It's really simple. But uh, I need to write some more lyrics. So if anybody wants to help me finish that song, we can do that. And uh, okay. And uh, so he's 12. They lost him. Again, Uh, a little, I hate to pick apart denominations, but I feel it's my job. When there's some error or teaching out there, I know, um, I hope people correct me when I'm wrong, but Mary is not divine, okay? She's a sinner saved by grace. Jesus, when he died on the cross, died for hers too. She says it later on in Luke when she does the song of Mary. She says, my God, my Savior. Well, who needs a Savior? Sinners. And here's proof. She, she blew it. She lost her son. So she wasn't batting a thousand. So here might be some text that might prove that she sinned. You know, she thought she, you know, whatever. It was a mistake, honest mistake. We'll give her that. But that's what sins are sometimes. We mess up. We miss the mark. And it could have been an honest mistake. It could have been intentional. So anyway, but again, there's a crowd of people and, you know, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters. It's a long journey from where they were going. And she, he, they thought they were, I thought he was with you. No, I thought he was you. Most missing children, that's how the story goes. I thought he was with you. No, I thought he said he was spending night at your house. But he, they told us they were spending night at your house. Meanwhile, they're out somewhere else doing what they shouldn't be doing, right? Yeah. So anyway, a little side note, extra credit. Keep an eye on your kids. We love them. So does God. And that's the highest calling is being a dad is being a mom, is taking care of the children God entrusted us. They're only on loan to us, right, until they're his, and then at that point we commit them to them, to him. So, verse 46, now, so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions, and all who heard him, capital H, Jesus, were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. So this is what we call Jewish guilt. It's a guilt trip. Um, you know, there's a, back in New York City, there was the Italian section, the Jewish section, the Chinatown, and there's a difference between the Jewish grandmother and the Italian grandmother. The Italian grandmother would say, Eat, eat, or I'm going to kill you. And the Jewish grandmother says, eat, eat, or I'm going to kill myself. (laughs) So anyway, so she tries to like blame him, right? And this is his answer, which we love. And this is kind of why we got the core of this message. Verse 49. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Word, side note. There's a lot of times we'll read the scriptures, we don't understand it when we hear it. And then down the road, ah, I get it. We have an aha moment. We get a little bit more understanding. Some things God dumps on us, we don't really fully get it when he gives it to us. But anyway, um, he goes on to say, and he went down from, and so he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So that's us. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to unpack that. So I want to show that verse 51. And he was subject to them. Now subject doesn't mean inferior. Because by no way is Jesus inferior to Joseph and Mary. He's the Messiah. He's the Holy One. Any much more than a husband or a wife who's subject to her husband. He's not better than her. It's just divine order. Right? And he's leading by example. So Jesus, as a child, has what? He's kept all the commandments. And what is the commandment? You'll find it in Deuteronomy chapter 5. So if you have your Bible, first one who gets there, I want you to look for Deuteronomy chapter 5. And it's a half of a 10. 
That's how I remember it. Deuteronomy, it's book five. It's the fifth book in the Bible. So I always think chapter five. And then Exodus, it's the second book in the Bible. Ten times two is 20. So I'm a you know, perfect ten kind of guy. So it's probably a harder way to remember it, but that's how I do it. The fifth book, chapter five. But Exodus chapter two times ten is chapter 20. Because the Ten Commandments are, to me, is a perfect ten. That's the ten. They're not suggestions. They're not recommendations. They're not, you know, uh, better ways, ten steps to improve your life. These are commandments. We're commanded because by nature we're not, by nature we're not naturally keeping these things. We're naturally prone to break them. That's why they are a commandment. God's not going to command you to do something you do naturally. So here it is. It's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5. Did anybody find it? It's page 200. 60, all right, or two six, sorry, 239, 239, and here's, there's the word wealth at the top left corner uh, for chapter 4, verse 40, go well, uh, yata, strongs, it gives you the whole, there's just a lot of great little study notes along the bottom there, um, there's, in between each chapter, there's a truth and action thing, so as we look at some of this, I want you to, you won't know what's on a page until you look at it, and if there's 3,000 pages, there's 3,000 lookups, but there's some extra knowledge in here that'll help you grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why we gave out these study Bibles. They're normally 30 bucks each on Amazon, but they're no good. It's sitting on this. It looks pretty up here. Do this in remembrance of me. We did communion last week, and some people say, oh, it's the Holy Bible. Holy means set apart. It's no special power to the book and its pages. It's the words on the page that are written on your heart. It's holy set apart. I've had some people say, hey, it's an old Bible. How can I, just, I feel guilty just throwing it away. Um, you know, you don't have to have a ceremony to destroy old Bibles. It's not sacred. You know, again, some denominations will sprinkle holy water on it. There's no holy water in the Bible. You won't find holy water in the Bible. You'll find anointing oil in the Bible. In James chapter 5, when someone's sick, they said anoint him with oil. The prayer of faith will save the sick. Not the oil, but the prayer of faith. The oil is always symbolic of the Holy Spirit being on someone. So again, there's a lot of traditions and a lot of different religions, but until you read your Bible front to cover, you won't know what's in it and what's not in it, and that's the best admonishment I can give you. So um, Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus 20, Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. They say this is the first commandment with a promise. If you do this, what's the promise? Your days will be long, and it'll be well with you. So a lot of us as adults, we don't have to obey our mom and dad anymore, but we still need to honor them. There are no perfect people on the planet. I'm by no means perfect. I made a lot of mistakes as a dad, but my daughters still honor me. And you may have some parents who weren't so perfect. And however you can do that, try to honor them today. Just give them the respect that God used your dad and your mom to bring you to fruition. There's no, God, there is no perfect. If God was using perfect people, he couldn't use anybody. Everybody's, you know, I don't have to labor that point. Everybody understands what I'm saying. But at the end of the day, this is a commandment to honor your father. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's honoring his parents. Even though he's born to be the king of the universe, king of the world, at 12 years old, he's subject to them. So I just want to kind of throw that in there. And here's how he specifically developed. And we'll get back to this in a little bit. So he developed, he advanced in wisdom, that's mentally. He advanced in stature, that's physically. He advanced in favor with God, that would be spiritually. And he advanced in favor with men, that's socially. So I've got to ask you, where are you today? Are you growing? Are you in wisdom? Are you getting smarter mentally? If you read the Bible front to cover, you'll be the smartest person in any group setting. I'm just telling you. You'll know, God will give you more wisdom than you'll ever understand through his scriptures. So I've visited probably and talked with over 200 Bible colleges and seminaries as part of answering the call. And I've always had 15, 20 minutes to talk theology with these guys. And I've enjoyed it because we're throwing verses back and forth. And my brother who saw me as a little kid, the little chump kid who turned into the crack addict who found my Bible at 31 years old. After 25 years, July 4th will be 25 years that God put four copies on one day in my hand. And I've been reading it every day, a little bit every day. 
And he, sit, he sits back and goes, wow, I see you go back and forth with these professors of, of t- college seminaries. And he goes, man, you really know your stuff. I said, dude, we're all working with the same book. And we're just throwing verses back and forth like a tennis match. And verses are great. And, you know, and we're all growing in our, in mentally and physically, working out. How many people know they're supposed to exercise? And how many people do? I mean, I've got excuses every morning. I think I did Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I hit the ground running. So I even, I even made it convenient. I said, I'm canceling my gym. I'm turning our guest room into a bench press, the bow flex, and the curls. And I still have a hard time crossing my hallway to get into that room for 20 minutes. So again, you know, there's 24 hours in a day. We should be growing physically. He advanced with favor with God that's spiritually, and he advanced with favor with men socially. So again, for the theologians who really struggle with the deity of Jesus, he's still 12, okay? And then some will give a lot of, uh, I guess, credit or to the baptism. You know, when John was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove, which started his ministry. I've heard lots of, you know... A, conjecture on how spiritually important that was that at that point he had the Holy Spirit upon him and that he was able to live a sinless life. I believe he was sinless from day one. And I'm sure um, Mary might have told his other four brothers, why can't you be more like Jesus? (laughs) Can't you be more like Jesus? James, James, can't you be more like Jesus? They probably got sick and tired of hearing that. Jesus was probably the perfect kid. I don't know. If he was sinless, I'd have to count his childhood as well. So those are some of the things I'm thinking about. So here's where we see the father concept. Again, nothing new. Pharisees and everyone else, when they would talk about God, it was our father. I mean, it wasn't really a brand new concept, but it was a we thing. And we talked about this last time we looked at this prayer. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in in heaven. And again, we see the we here. It's not just me. Give me this day my daily bread. It's give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, not forgive me. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 25 years reading the Bible, six months ago, somebody pointed that out to me. It's a we, us prayer. And I was like, wow, how come I've never seen that before? Because me, when I'm praying it, Lord, forgive me, give me my daily bread, get, you know, forgive me my sins. I just, you know, it's always about me. And uh, he teaches us to pray we and us and our, which is kind of cool. So anyway, this is, you know, uh, some will call it the Our Father prayer because it starts with that. Some have it memorized. And uh, it's easy to have memorized prayers. And I don't think he was... He said, in this manner, he didn't say pray this prayer, pray these words. He said, in this manner. So I think he's given us a model. But a lot of people can rattle this off and, you know, like anything else they've memorized. And Jesus in the scriptures says, you know, you're, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far away from me. And that's what religion does sometimes. We get so wrapped up in going through the motions, this can be just another Thing to do, check off, even reading your Bible. Oh, I got to read my Bible. And he's like, quick, quick, what's the, what's the chapter for today? Mm, get it done, check mark, check mark. What I got to do, check mark. And we just got a list of things we're blowing through on a daily basis. But when that starts happening, I stop reading my Bible on a regular basis, on a, like a daily Bible reading plan. I'm like, listen, I'm just doing it for a check mark. I still think something will pop off at you. But when you're supposed to do it, it's good to have a plan. It's good to have a schedule. Because if you don't schedule it, it just never gets done. But, you know, leave room for the Holy Spirit to interrupt your schedule. There's always a right time and a right place, whether you're tired or whenever, you, you know, uh, driving in the car, you can catch up on the audio, just listening to it. A lot of people I know will listen to podcasts and audio versions. So we have a lot of tools and technology to help us listen to the Word of God and get to know our Father because this Bible is a love letter, right? It's the scriptures that, that make us wise unto salvation. That's what Paul told Timothy. You've known the scriptures from a young age, which is able to make you wise unto salvation, to save you from, but also save you for God, right? So here we are in John 5. I want to show you this. So Jesus keeps doing miracles on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees had a lot of extra oral laws of what you can't do on the Sabbath. And um, so this was really just causing them to short circuit, thinking he can't be from God, he could, he has six other days to, six days do all your work, seventh day rest, keep it holy unto the Lord, for the six days the Lord made the earth, seventh day he rested, that's our model, that's our, so here he is doing a work, 
And I would probably guess that any miracle Jesus did took a half a second. I mean, it was like, so it be done. Boom, done. This wasn't like a 12-hour work day. And that's kind of what he's talking about with six days, do all your work, seven day rest. If you work with a shovel 12 hours a day, put your shovel away. If whatever your work is, you know, there's a day of rest. Anybody wants to know what rest looks like, you go to dictionary.com and you type in the word rest, and it means a state of inactivity. When was the last day you had a whole day with no activity? That's why it's a commandment. Because we're busy, busy, busy. I had a hard time yesterday, we, you know, because I knew last Saturday and Sunday we were out at the RAIM, uh, broadcasting the RAIM uh, event in Church Rock, and then Sunday this, getting up early, working on a sermon, setting up cameras. By the time I get home, it's 4 or 5 o'clock. It's a work day. You know, I'm working and I'm pouring it out. So, and then Monday through Friday, you know, by, by Thursday, I was sluggish because I didn't have a day of rest. So we really determined to try to be couch potatoes a little bit yesterday, try to take a nap. And your mind just keeps going, well, I can get this done. I can get, you know, you start a little laundry, get this going. It's just different activity, but, you know, you feel guilty for not resting. That's why God made it a commandment, as well as a commandment to honor your mother and your father. Does that come naturally sometimes? Absolutely not. It's a commandment, and it's one with the promise. Extra credit. Go to Proverbs chapter 3. Just say, I want to... Before I, I, I move on too fast, so Proverbs and, and Psalms is right in the middle. So that gets you in the middle. And uh, first one to get there, Proverbs, Psalms. So Proverbs comes after Psalms. And again, as you continue to thumb through your Bible, you kind of figure out where stuff is. And then you can underline and highlight your Bible. I encourage you to do that because the next time you find a good verse, as you're turning pages and see one highlighted and underlined, just stop and reread it. Now you're on the way to memorizing verses. But look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. What does it say? It's on page 832 for those who have a 3,000 page spirit filled Bible study Bible. Page 832. My son, do not forget my law, but let, their, let your heart keep my commands. Verse 2 For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Isn't that what happened to Jesus when he was 12? Does that sound a little bit familiar? So here's King Solomon, Solomon hundreds and hundreds of years later, realizing this is a secret. Keep being obedient to God's word, his law, his statutes, his commandments. They give life. You know, you know, some people may think he's trying to ruin the party, but that lifestyle is hard. The mess it makes, the consequences of sin is hard. Dealing with all the legal repercussions of a DUI or domestic violence or anything else. You start getting in front of the judge because you violated some laws, you got some hoops to jump through, some fines to pay, maybe jail time. It's consequences. But what does he say here? For verse 2, for length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. I grew up, my dad was Catholic, and uh, we had 10 brothers, and he had 10 brothers and sisters, and every time one of my, and he was one of the babies, so one of the uncles and aunts would die, and he's like, they all played pinochle. says, oh, another one's playing pinochle in the sky. So I got thinking there's a lot of card games up in the sky, and they're playing pinochle. They're all hanging out playing pinochle. I'm like, okay, that's what I heard. But he said, when your number's up, your number's up. My dad was also a deli man. So when you go to the deli, sometimes you got to go to that little paper tape and, oh, number 12, how many people are here? How long is this going to be? Now serving number eight. I've got four more people. Now serving number nine. You're like, again, we got a checklist. Can I go run to aisle three and get something before I get back so I don't miss my number 12 being called, right? You know? But he looked at death as when your number's up, your number's up. And I don't see it in the scriptures like that. I say I can keep my number from coming up if I practice obedience. If I look both ways before I cross the street, my number's not coming up today. <laughs> I'm not going to see the morticianer. If I keep texting and driving, my number might come up sooner rather than later. And I'm telling you, as I'm sitting here before you, there was, I usually, I do, I do a lot of 12, 13 hour road trips and I do a lot of voice texting and it's usually when there's no one around. And um, one time I was driving through some city traffic and I tried to squeeze one out and I heard it in my heart and it says, really? 
I've saved you from crack cocaine and from cancer, and you want to go out like this? Okay, put the phone away. <laughs> I'm not dying today, you know, it's not that important. But I was, again, I thought I could manage or try to squeeze out one more text, and it was kind of crazy, and I'm like, I started violating my own little safety policy, right? So, and again, there's a lot of people who have perished from texting and driving. It's horrible, it's tragic. But God didn't have them die that day. It was a mistake, it was sin. Twice it says in Proverbs 14, chapter 14 and chapter 16, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. That frightens me. So, we, that's why we read the word, that's why we honor our mother and father. As we're growing up, their, their job is to keep you safe. They're, they give you rules and boundaries and guidelines to keep us safe, right? So we'll keep moving on. So I didn't do John chapter 5, sorry. So John 5, 17 through 19, but Jesus answered him, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So here's Jesus, Lord of all, King of kings, Lord of lords. Six days God made heavens and earth and everything in it, and on the seventh day the Lord rested. And God hasn't rested since. God is 24-7, 365, always working. He's still working now, he's working. He does... In, in the Old Testament, it says, we serve a God that neither sleeps nor slumbers. God doesn't take a nap. He doesn't need to go to sleep like we do, right? But here, Jesus is saying, on the Sabbath day, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I, that was my commandment to you guys. You know, you're not holding me to that. This was, that was my gift to you to give you a day off. The, you know, he's, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. In later other areas, he over explains that. But this is where he says, my father. My father? Because again, in John chapter 8, a little bit later, he says, you say he's your father, but if he really was your God, uh, you would love me because he sent me. You have a different God. You may say you're sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but your father's the devil. And it was a who's your daddy question. If you want to read John chapter 8 in a couple chapters, he says, you're trying to kill me. A man has done nothing but tell you the truth. Why can't you understand what I'm telling you? Because there's no truth in you. Your father's the devil. He's the father of lies. There's no truth in him. He's a liar and the father of lies and a murderer. And you're trying to murder me. And they're like, oh, we're not sons of fornication. They knew the whole story about Mary getting pregnant without being married to Joseph, which was considered sex outside of marriage, which is still fornication. We live in a highly sexualized culture Sex between a man and a woman when they're married is beautiful. Sex outside of marriage, that was the first Bible study I got my hands on 25 years ago when I started reading the Bible. I'm like, okay, because that's when I checked out at 18 in a Catholic service. The priest threw out there, sex outside of marriage was a sin. I said, well, if that's the rules, I'm gone. There's a lot of pretty girls at school that I had a plan on the weekends to get some beer and wine coolers, smoke a little pot, get them in the jacuzzi in Fort Lauderdale and try to have my way. That's who I was. I'm not that anymore. So when I say what I've been forgiven of, I've been forgiven of a lot. Whoever's been forgiven much loves much. So God gave me three daughters as payback. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's just, you know better. You know, I mean, and they, dear, you know, I, I said all the right things when I picked up my girlfriends from a date, you know. Anyway, there's wolves dressed in sheep's clothing out there. I was one of them until God got on the inside and changed my heart, changed my life. Oh, complete overhaul. So I'm probably the least qualified to be a pastor, but at the other end, I'm probably the most qualified because I've worked both sides. You know, criminals who become cops, or sometimes cops become criminals because they know both sides and they, they get really good at it. So anyway, he calls him my father. He's always working. God's always working. Jesus is always working. And therefore, again, he's claiming to be God. They thought that was blasphemy and they were seeking to kill him. So look at, look at John chapter 10, verse 22 to 30. Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, a.k.a. Messiah, tell us plainly. 
And Jesus said, I told you, you do not believe me. The words that I do in my Father's name, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe me because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Just preached on this a few weeks ago. And I know them popped out at me. I've been quoting this verse just off the back of my head. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. My, and all of a sudden, this time, last time, I preached, wait a minute, who snuck in that I know them part? I, I forgot that was in there. Jesus knows you. If you're his and he's yours, he knows you. You'll never hear, depart from me, I never knew you. You might hear, you knew better, and that one's costing. That's going to cost you. You might even hear, this might hurt you more than, it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you with the consequences. Right? How many dads have said that before the whipping of the belt? This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I don't think so. <laughs> that stings. I mean, I know you feel bad about having to discipline me, but this hurts. That hurts right there. <laughs> it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I don't know. Well, that's up for debate. I don't want to argue with you. I've got to honor you and obey you. I get it. You know, but can we debate it a little bit? How far can you debate with your parents without dishonoring them? So, anyway, so it's Father's Day, right? We're trying to bring it back to this message. So, the works that I do in my Father's name, my Father again, again, a little bit outside of our Father, give us, we, stuff, saying, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, verse 28, and they shall never perish. Never means never. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Nobody can take you away from Jesus, but you can walk out on him. I'll just say that. Do you ever quit a job? You walk out on a job? So John chapter 6, verse 66, I always say is the saddest chapter and verse number. Not many chapters have 60 plus verses. But if you want to look up John chapter 6, verse 66, it's a good time to read it in your Bible. Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 5. Man, it even helps me get to the pages quickly. So it's... 1870, sorry, is that 15, 15, 19? I need readers. 56 years old, so like, arm's not long enough. So 1509, is that 1509? Help me. Yeah. Yeah, 1509. The bottom right corner, John chapter 6, verse 66, he just got done saying in verse 54, whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has everlasting life, and I'll raise them up on the last day. They're thinking cannibalism, and it goes over their head in verse 66. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Does that sound like an antichrist verse? John 666, the antichrist. Many disciples, they were disciples, they turned and followed him no more. Up, uh, he lost me on that one. Up, uh, he lost me on that one. So, my pastor used to say, this book is an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> You're going to come across some things that are hard to understand, hard to live by. So that's John chapter 66. Again, the couple, there's like three word welts there um, on different words you can look, look for, like withdrawn. And the scriptures, um, graphe, strongs, concordance, uh, graph, graphic, biography, autograph, a document, anything within holy writ, the scriptures, it goes on to talk about that. So it talks, when he says the word scriptures, what, use, what word is he using there? So some will talk about the Old Testament. Is Paul's writing scripture? Is James, and we can, we can do a study on that. I heard Pastor Bill do a great study on that, how it is, because they both reference each other as the scriptures Paul wrote and James. And again, we have a holy canon here, 66 books. We believe that all this is scripture. Uh, the Latter-day Saints, New Buck, no, it's not scripture. This is not. The, the, witness, the witness Tower, uh, written by Jehovah Witnesses. They don't even know who wrote it, who translated it. It's not in the front. They don't have the names or the committee who did the translation, and they've changed some things. Uh, so just be careful on the translation in the books that you read. And um, again, there's a lot of good resources out there, and we talk about that. So 
So we keep saying, verse 28, I give them eternal life, they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Verse 30, I and my Father are one. And since I brought up Jehovah Witnesses, I hate to just again, you have to, if you, you know some of the differences, not all religions are the same. That's a cop out because you don't want to do the research. You start looking at different religions, you'll certainly see some differences. God is love is probably the only thing that everybody can agree on. God is love. That's actually a standalone verse in the Bible. But the most loving thing God will do is correct you when you're wrong. Right? We've been talking about judging. It's crazy, Jared. Wednesday night talked about John. We looked at Matthew 7, 1. Judge not lest you be judged. And that whole up to verse 12, the golden rule. And all of a sudden, Friday, I have a, a show called Christian Legal Society. And Lakita's like, hey, let's do Matthew 7. <laughs> we just did that two days ago. And it's like the same verses come up in different places, different conversations. That's like God just trying to continue to show you a little bit more about this verse. But Jehovah Witnesses don't think Jesus is a deity. They'll knock on your door and say, the Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. They springboard from that. Well, either is Chuck, but I'm in the Bible. He talks about me. I'm the sinner that became a saint or whatever, you know, saved by grace. My name specifically is not in the Bible, but he's talking about me and to me. But you see the Father, you see the Son, you see the Holy Spirit, John 14, 16, and 17. He explains it, um, the, all four. You know, I'm going back to the Father. He's going to send the Holy Spirit in my name, pray in my name. And, you know, your Father, and it's just, you see all three. It's a three-ring circus, me, myself, and I. And again, it's the mystery of the Trinity. But whenever they knock on your door, say, what, do you mean, what does this verse mean to you? Verse 30, I and my Father are one. Hey, good to see you. Come on in. So they're one. And again, talking to Jewish people, they knew in, 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 the, in the scriptures, I think it's Deuteronomy 4. Is it Deuteronomy 4 where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Let's look that up for, sec, for uh, extra credit. The Lord is one. So another thing I want to show you, it is Deuteronomy 6, 4. I knew there was a 4 in there. So it's chapter 6, verse 4. Let's look at your Bibles. It's the fifth book in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then we'll close. So Deuteronomy chapter 4, and this is the retelling of the law. Deuteronomy chapter 6, so it's page... Is that 183? Yeah, 183? Wow. I should get my readers up here. That's chapter 8. Go back to chapter 6. Page 180. So verse chapter 6, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If a person commits a trespass against the Lord by trying to, by, by lying to his neighbor, and about what was delivered to him, and spokesperson goes down to verse 4. Where's verse 4? It did say 6-4, right? Ah, I'm in Leviticus, ha. Huh? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Here we go. Yeah. So that's the thing about a study Bible. It's so full, that font is a little small. So um, some of us need big print Bibles. But Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Right? So remember in the Gospels when they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? That's where he went to. Love your Lord your God with all your heart. The second one's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So when he says the Father and I are one, I am the Lord Jesus. Little L Lord. Sarah called Abraham Lord. And if you look back in Genesis, it's a little L. It's not the capital L. So Jesus is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And again, he honors his Father. He's honoring his father in everything he says, everything he does, and that's our job. So back to the Father's Day tie-in, and we'll end with this. That's an eternal relationship. God is our father, Abba Father, which Abba means daddy, so it's like daddy, daddy. Our conscience bears witness that we are children of God. If you believe that you're a child of God, 
John chapter 1, verse 12 says, Whoever has received him, talking about Jesus, he gave them the right to become children of God. So if you haven't received Jesus, and I'm just going to bottom line it, you may be God's creation, but you're not a child of God. You're separated by your sin. Our sin separates us from God, just like my, if I sinned against you, we're going to have a relationship problem. If I stole your wallet, or I stole your purse, or I punched you in the face, or I started talking bad about you, you might block me from Facebook, you might take, might, not going to take my calls until I ask for forgiveness or try to make restitution, give you your wallet and your money back that was in the wallet, and I'm sorry, I promise not to do it again, and you have a choice to either forgive me, but you don't have to trust me. And that's an important part. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, not anyone else. Nowhere in Scripture will you find a verse where God tells you to trust anybody. He says, love them, but some people you've got to keep at a distance. You can forgive them, and it doesn't even mean you need to reconcile, because if they're going to continue to hurt you and abuse you, you don't have to be in a, an everyday relationship with that person. Sometimes having some space and loving them from afar is the best you can do. So again, when we say Father's Day, not everybody is, oh, I'm so happy to celebrate my father. Someone's like, he's a, he was a jerk. He never showed. I don't even know who he is. And if that's one of you guys out there on the run and haven't made con connection with any of your kids, today's the day to get right with him and to get right with your... It's all about relationships. We talked about it uh, when we are going through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And uh, who does the, uh, the, was it the Blue Bible Project? Um, the, the, the video that we watched talked about righteousness. Logos, Logos Bible. The Bible Project. They had this great little video that does a whole little overcap on the Sermon on the Mount. But he talks about righteousness. And he just sums it up as living right in a right relationship with God and a right relationship with people. And there are no perfect parents, moms or dads. We just want to honor them. You may be an adult. You may have your own family. You want your kids to honor and obey you. And again, it's the commandment that comes with a promise. So if you still have parents, honor them. If you're young enough to need to obey them, and you're, it's pleasing to God. The only time you can disobey your parents, you ready, is when they tell you to sin. Hey, go into that store and lie to them, tell them this, that, that. And the, sorry, Dad, can't say that. Uh, that would be a lie. Um, I'm going to have to go with God on this one. <laughs> he said, thou shalt not bear false witness. We're not going to lie. That's how I live. If your parents are asking you to sin, you can smile and wave and say, no, I can't do that. I'm going to honor God on this one. I'm going to keep the commandments, and I encourage you to start doing the same. <laughs> I'm praying for you, Dad. Praying for you, Mom. I hope you, you know, whatever. So that's our job is to encourage one another. Sometimes, but again, um, you know, there's, it's a crazy world. There's a lot of dysfunction in families. I get that. And... Um, and sometimes unconditional respect and unconditional love will convict a person to change. You know? So just pray about that in ways that we can honor and respect our parents. But more importantly, our job here is to make sure you have a right relationship with God. So the bottom line is, I've been watching a lot of Ray Comfort. I think they do, they do a lot of great street evangelism, and they record them, and they just ask people, hey, you know, and it's amazing some of the answers you'll hear some of these people and some of the things they think, where they run into Buddhists, they run into atheists, they run into all kinds of people who think they're saved, we call them false converts, and they'll just ask them, hey, do you think yourself is a good person? Do you think you're a good person? Most people say, yeah. There's a proverb that says most people proclaim their own, their own righteousness. They think they're, oh, I've never murdered anybody. Okay, so we have a good person test. Do you mind if we ask a couple questions to see if that's true? I said, sure. I said, well, um, how many lies do you think you've ever told? Oh, uh, countless. So what does that make you? And some will smart alecly say, well, that makes me human. So, but if I lie to you, what are you going to call me? A liar. <laughs> so you can see sin on somebody else, but you can't see it on yourself. So when you lie, you're a, uh, and again, I'm just asking questions. I'm not telling anyone. I'm just asking questions. And they'll say, so when I lie to you, you'd call me a, uh, so, but when you lie, you're a, okay. So, uh, another commandment is, um, you know, thou shalt not steal. Have you ever taken anything that wasn't yours? No matter the, whatever the price. You ever steal a candy bar? Do you ever download illegal music? Have music that you never paid for? That's a dollar a song. 
You steal a dollar, you steal a million dollars, you're still a... If I stole something for you, you'd call me a... So when you steal something that's not yours, it's... You're a thief. All right, I'm borrowing. I'll bring it back. <laughs> office supplies, taking home office supplies that aren't yours for the house. I mean, it doesn't matter how much it costs, but you're taking something that's not yours. Thou shalt not steal. So, um, and then, have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? In a cuss word? That's serious. That's a serious offense. Would you ever use your mom's name as a cuss word? Why? Because you love your mom, you want to honor your mom, but you'll use God's name as an expletive, and that's blasphemy, and that's very serious. And then, you know, it says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And Jesus said, if you've ever looked at a woman and lusted for her in her heart, you've committed adultery with her in her heart. Have you ever lusted after someone? And they go, oh, yeah, all the time. And like they're out at the beach, Santa Monica Beach, and I'm doing it right now. I mean, there's people all over the place with bikinis on, right, or whatever. And then, then somebody will say, well, I'm gay. Well, have you ever lusted after another same-sex person? Of course. So, anyway, or had sex out of marriage. You ever look at porn? You know, that, that's... That's adultery. You're looking at another man's wife. She's not yours. It's another man's wife before she gets married to him. So, I mean, there's, the whole world is in trouble with this one. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, unless, you know, you're like that. A very fraction of a percent who's got that gift of celibacy and just doesn't have those kind of attractions towards same sex or opposite sex, uh, whatever. I mean, it's sexual sin. So he goes, by your own admission, you told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterous at heart. And I've only covered four of the Ten Commandments. So, on Judgment Day, are you going to be innocent or guilty? So, do you deserve heaven or hell? And does that concern you? I just met you, and it concerns me. I love you. I don't want to see you go there. Do you know what God did for you? And most will know the gospel. Yeah, he sent his son to die on the cross. He says, well, in order to believe you know, and repent... And we talk about a change of mind, change of heart, change of directions, to trust in the Lord and repent from your sins. If not, you're a hypocrite. I believe Jesus died for my sins, but I'm going to keep robbing banks every day. If bank, bank robbery or stealing was my sin of choice, and I'm robbing banks and embezzling and stealing identities and stealing, wiping out people's credit cards, and I'm wearing a cross that had holy water from a Catholic church like the Mafia, <laughs> whacking people, and on Sunday, they put a stack of money in the plate. Uh, and again, my dad was an usher, and my brothers used to, uh, you know, help him with the ushering plates. And he saw a lot of money in the ushering plate one day, and my dad says, that's good. He said, no, that's bad. He goes, why? He goes, somebody in here did something really, really bad. <laughs> they did something really, really bad, so they had to put a extra money in the offering plate. You know, I mean, that was just, again, uh, maybe some people work God like that. But at the end of the day, he sent his son to pay the penalty for our sin. We're trusting in that, but there also is an obligation to turn away from your sin and to follow him and to walk in obedience. Amen? That's how we honor our Father. That's how he says, you can, you can honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far away from me. It's always a heart issue. God loves you. He wants us to fall in love with him. We just read it in Deuteronomy uh, 6.4. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, Right? In John 15, Jesus said, if you love me, because there's an if there. You don't have to. I can't make you love me. I can't make anybody love me. I didn't make my wife love me. She just loved me because I'm lovable. But there's some days she doesn't love me. Because I can be a jerk too, right? So yeah, I like you. I mean, I love you, but I don't like you right now. I used to hear that from my mom all the time. I love you so much, Chucky, but I don't like you right now. You're, you need to straighten up. You need to get your act together, right? And that's loving when someone tells you that. So... Let's pray and ask God to, uh, to show us how we can love him more, love our neighbor, honor our mother, father, and, uh, and everyone else for that matter. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, Father, we thank you for the study today. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the scriptures. I thank you that you and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one living God who have manifested yourself in, in uh, these different ways, and you've given us the gift of the Holy Spirit I pray, God, right now for that person who hears my voice that has not yet made you Lord and Savior of their lives, like today would be the day of salvation, that they would call upon your name, they would, it would be sincere, it would be genuine, that it would stick, that they wouldn't fall away or turn away, um, and we, that they would get plugged in to you, your people, to be a part of your kingdom, advancing that, and also on this amazing search and rescue mission to go looking for the lost. So we pray, God that you would continue to give us wisdom, and like Jesus, that we would grow uh, physically, spiritually, and mentally, and socially, Lord, with amongst our peers, that we'd find favor with you and favor with men. 
which opens up doors to share the gospel in word and deed. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Anyone who wants to go back and take a look at some of our previous messages, Fruitland Christian Fellowship, we're on Overcomers TV every night, 9 o'clock Mountain Time till 10. We usually go for about an hour. You can also go to our YouTube channel, Facebook page. We've got a, we're up to 116 subscribers. We're a small little church here doing some big things. Also, the audio is available. Um, thanks for mentioning it uh, last week, Jared, but I swapped out Google with Amazon Music. So Apple, Spotify, iHeart, uh, Apple Podcast, uh, all that. So also Wednesday night, come join us. We have Food and Fellowship. Uh, we're probably finishing up the Sermon on the Mount, Chapter 7, this week, this Wednesday. And we'll see. And uh, it's, it's conversational, and that's what I love about our Wednesday night fellowship. It's, we have food and fellowship, and we talk about it. So... Um, we grow. So if you're ever in a neighborhood, come join us. Uh, 701 County Road 6100, Fruitland, New Mexico. It's right next to Kirtland. And next door is Farmington in the Four Corners area. Give us a call, 505-374-8900. Or shoot us an email, fruitlandchristianfellowship at gmail.com. And until our next service, may you and your families be blessed.